Good evening and welcome to this evening's presentation and indeed welcome to all of the health presentations that will be going on throughout this week. Uh, my name is Rudy Davis, this is my wife Jeannie. We are both naturopathic doctors and I must add that we are Christians. Now there's a very important reason why I add that and that is because we come from a different perspective than the average naturopathic doctor. We believe that everything you need for healing can be found in your backyard garden or in your grocery store. Now this is a refreshing uh, thing to most people who come to see us at our offices. But uh, in fact we found it is absolutely true. So um, from a Christian perspective, if there's anyone in the audience that is not a Christian at all, please do not be offended. We're not here to make anybody Christians. The reason why I tell you this is because the things we're going to share with you are things which we learned from the scriptures. It enabled myself to become well and thousands of others to become extremely healthy, recovering from all kinds of diseases. So we hope that your ears are going to be open. You're going to be listening and we will present to you things which you can write down, take home with you and try these things if they seem reasonable to you and see what results you will get. Now our presentations, we do sort of a tag team presentation. So Rudy will present some of the information and then I'll present some. So you'll get to hear from both of us through the evening. Uh, we're very thankful that each of you have come out and we hope that you continue to come out through the week. You're going to probably learn some very interesting things, things that you've probably not uh, thought about before. So we hope you'll be able to continue to come throughout the rest of the meetings. Okay. What we need is something called a paradigm shift. A paradigm shift means if we have been taught one way, we've built our learning upon a certain premise. But I'm going to take a paradigm shift. I'm going to build our learning on a different premise. And I'll show you exactly what it is I mean. A woman, early 40s, came to see us simply because she was addicted to pain medications. She was on two major pain medications and an antidepressant, which would help the pain medications to work even better for her. This woman was on four times the amount of pain medication that she should have been on or anybody should be on, and her doctor wanted her to go on double that amount, plus see a psychiatrist to help her deal with the fact that she would have this pain the rest of her life. Now her pharmacist told her the same thing. You don't get off these pain medications. She phoned us in desperation and came to see us because she felt we were the only people that could help her. In one week, she was off all her pain medications. Addiction overcome. No pain. Isn't that amazing? We need a paradigm shift in our thinking. And that is, to get the results you have never had, you have to do the things you have never done. The things we are told are impossible, are not always impossible. I do not fault anyone for what they believe. But sometimes what a person has been taught is not exactly what is truth. A man in his mid-70s came to see us. His doctor wanted to cut off his left leg just below the knee. Gangrene was setting into his left foot. And in order to stop the gangrene from going further into his system, cut off the leg. He didn't want to lose his leg, so he came to see us and said, is there anything that can be done? So we told him, as Christians, look, we will do the best we can and we'll pray for guidance in this matter. Within 10 days, this man was off his medication 
which he was taking for a very high heart rate. His heart rate was 130 beats a minute, 90 beats a minute with his medication. In less than 10 days, he was off his medication. His heart rate was 72 beats a minute, and his left foot was turning pink. Health had been restored to his foot. Another doctor, a medical doctor, came to see us. This man was um, diabetic. His blood sugars are 26 to 28 on a regular basis. When he came to see us, his wife came with him. He asked what could be done for this. So I looked at his blood work and I counseled the man what it is he should do. And he said, this goes against everything I have been taught. And his darling wife said, sweetheart, everything you have been taught isn't working. Why don't you try this? He said, sweetheart, you're right. I'll try it. In six days, his wife phoned. She kept strict records of everything. His blood sugar levels throughout that whole six days. And she said he sees it, but he almost doesn't believe it. His blood sugars are five and six on a regular basis with no medication. Isn't that amazing? We need a paradigm shift. Disease is not the result of old age. From a Christian viewpoint, disease is the result of a violation of the laws of health. And when we see those laws learned and obeyed, guess what we see disappear? Disease. A lot of times, if it doesn't disappear totally, it's halted in its tracks. Now, it sounds like, by what I'm saying, every disease can be cured. Yes. I believe so, but not every body can be cured. Sometimes the disease has such a momentum going that the body cannot stop it and turn it around before the disease takes over and the person dies. Do these things make sense to you? I hope so, because I'm going to share with you some very fascinating things. So get your thinking caps on and look at these things with us. Now then, According to the American Medical Association and the World Health Organization, America is in the worst epidemic of chronic degenerative disease that mankind has ever known. We're doing something wrong. The hospital industry is one of the largest in the nation. One of five Americans under the age of 17 has already had a chronic disease. Autopsies have indicated that every child over the age of four already has incipient, that means the beginning of, two severe cardiac problems. Constipation is a national disease. The highest over-the-counter medication sold in North America is what? Laxatives. Isn't that something? Laxatives, highest over-the-counter medication. An estimated 42 million Americans suffer high blood pressure. That's about a quarter of the population, maybe even more. About 24,000 tons of aspirin are taken yearly. How many aspirins do you think would fill up one ton? That's a lot of aspirin, isn't it? 24,000 tons. Okay, over 5 billion sleeping pills are consumed annually. We're not going to the bathroom, and we're not able to sleep. Something wrong. What we've been doing isn't working. Now, remember what I said. To get the results you've not had, you have to do the things you've never done. Here's where we're going to start. Why are we so unhealthy? Well, I'm going to take a look at nutrition, food, and our health. Let's see what it has to do. Does what I put in my mouth have anything to do with my health or lack of it? The National Academy of Sciences in the United States estimates that 60% of women's cancers and 40% of men's cancers are related to nutritional factors. The cancers all most closely associated with nutritional factors are breast and endometrial cancer in women, prostate cancer in men, and gastrointestinal cancer. Okay. 
the Inter International Journey Journal of Cardiology reported that certified death rates from coronary heart disease are positively correlated country by country with milk consumption, particularly with that of the non-fat portion of milk. And the American Cl Journal of Clinical Nutrition reported the results of a study involving U.S. male health professionals between 45 and 75 years of age who were studied for eight years to determine the relationship between carotenoids and the development of cataracts. They determined that consuming foods high in carotenoids reduced the risk of cataracts. Broccoli and spinach were most consistently associated with a lower risk of cataract. So now you tell me, does food and what we eat have anything to do with our health? Well, I'm going to do something here. I'll ask you a question. Why do we eat food? Think with me. Why do we eat food? Well, I'll show you why. The first reason is because glucose. Glucose is the only fuel this body runs on. It doesn't run on protein. It doesn't run on vitamins and minerals. It runs on glucose. If you have a diesel engine, what kind of fuel does it run on? Diesel fuel. We run on glucose. The next reason we eat food is for protein. The next reason for fatty acids. There are six reasons in total. The fourth for minerals, the fifth for enzymes and vitamins, and the sixth for water. These are the six reasons why we eat foods. Not because we're hungry, but because our body needs nutrition. Now I want to share with you that minerals, enzymes and vitamins and water are not really nutrition, but glucose, protein, fatty acids, are nutrition. It's just that the minerals, the enzymes, the vitamins are catalysts that enable the nutrition to be used by the body. All right, real food versus junk food. We're going to get into the arena here and I'm going to look at what's the difference between a junk food and a real food. Now I'm going to put up the six reasons why we eat food plus one more. We're going to add toxins to the list. Now I'm going to ask you a question here. What do you think is in this carrot. Does it have glucose? Oh yes, that's a certified organic carrot by the way. The picture doesn't look like it, but it is. Yes, it has glucose. What about this donut right over here? Does that have glucose? Yes, it does. What about protein? Does that carrot have protein? No, carrot doesn't have protein. Okay. <laughs> Do we need to eat animal products? That's a good question. It is a good one. Uh, do we need to eat? No, no, no. no, we don't. We really don't. Okay. Yeah. What about that donut? Is that a protein? Well, it's got a little bit, about 130 seconds. Sometimes they use egg whites in the donuts, right? So it's a very fractional amount. Now, what about fatty acids? Does that carrot have fatty acids? Yes, it does. What about that donut? Well, it's got fat, but it doesn't have fatty acids. Okay, that's very important. Fatty acids are very, very heat sensitive. And if for the most part of your foods, you've got a lot of cooked foods, you're losing your essential fatty acids. Now, half the weight of your brain is made up of essential fatty acids. So if you're not getting enough fatty acids in, what's going to happen? You might not be able to reason properly. Look at this. <clears throat> minerals. Does that carrot have minerals? Almost a no-brainer, isn't it? But what about that donut? Nope. What about enzymes and vitamins? Does that carrot get enzymes and vitamins? Sure does. What about the donut? No. Well, you see, they used to be in that place where they took the hole out of. <laughs> Gone now, isn't it? What about water? Does that carrot have water? Yeah. Certainly does. What about the donut? A little bit. About 1 20th. Now what about toxins? Remember that's a certified organic carrot. Does that have toxins? No. Nope, it's got a red X. But what about that donut? Sure does. Now you see the difference between a real food and a junk food is that a junk food is missing one or more 
of the six reasons why we eat food. One or more of those, then it becomes a junk food. That would make things like tofu technically what? A junk food. A junk food. It's missing one or more of these. And high heat, remember, destroys your fatty acids. Can destroy the enzymes. After 107 degrees Fahrenheit, your enzymes are, they're dead. 107 degrees Fahrenheit. Isn't that something? Now, when you're cooking food, do your slow oven is what? 250? 300? That's a lot higher than 107 degrees. So we start to lose the nutrient composition of foods. In all of the research that I have done on flesh foods and all the nutrients found in them, I have not found one nutrient that is not available in plant sources. So we see that plants are more like nutrient storehouses. But fleshy creatures like fish and birds and insects and animals and man are nutrient users. God has provided everything we need in nutrient storehouses. All right, what impact do junk foods have on the body? Does it make a difference whether I eat the donut or whether I eat the carrot? Well, let's just take a look. This is the citric acid cycle. Now, it is not an exact replica of the citric acid cycle. The citric acid cycle is very complicated. So we've simplified it for the sake of being able to reach people who do not have a biochemical background. Are there any biochemists in the group here tonight? Okay, well that's good. I'm going to explain it in terms which everybody can understand. Does that make sense? Because if you leave here and you don't understand what I said, then what good has it been? So look at this. As we look at the citric acid cycle, when glucose comes into the system, there it is right up there flashing on the screen. Here comes the glucose. It's going to go down into the cell. Now, at the cell, there are little stations, A, B, C, D, E. There's actually about 10 in all, but for the sake of brevity, we'll put about five in here. This glucose will be examined as it is at this station A. And as it's examined, the body wants to know, is there a proper enzyme count in this that I can send it on to station B? Okay, well, let's just see. If it was that carrot, then what does the body say? Great, go on to station B. But what if that is the donut? What does the body do? There's no enzyme in it. So where's the body going to get an enzyme from? From itself. It's got to manufacture what it needs to burn that glucose and turn it into proper food. What about a mineral now? If that's the carrot at that station, has it got minerals? Sure does. What about the donut? No minerals. So what's the body going to do when it says, look, this person only put a donut in this morning. That's all the glucose I've got to run on. So body, let's do something here. Where's the body going to get a mineral from to process that donut? Could be from the bones. Look at that. Look over there in the bones. Lots of minerals there. Let's take from these bones and let's process this glucose and get this person up and going. So that's what it'll do. And at each station, a check happens. And it is slightly altered at each station in order to manufacture adenosine triphosphate, send it out into the cells and supply the body with glucose. So you see it goes to every single one of those stations. Now, this happens about... 30,000 times a second. So it's not slow. It's very rapid. About 30,000 times a second. And finally, it goes out as adenosine triphosphate. Does everyone understand what I just presented to you? So can you see if you've got a diet based on Coke and donuts or coffee and donuts in the morning? What's going to happen over the years will depend on your enzyme bank. It'll depend on your mineral bank. What kind of genetics did you inherit from your parents? If you inherited a very good constitution, then it will take you longer to get sick than the person who inherited a very weak constitution, simply because they never had as much to draw on as you did. Does this make sense to you? Okay, so you can only go on so long with this. Now, this is going to lead us to an acid-alkaline balance in the human body. 
A donut, for instance, will cause the body to go acidic, but a carrot, a raw carrot, will cause the body to go alkaline. Now, ideally, you take a look at something like a swimming pool. If a swimming pool becomes too acidic, what happens to the pipes? They become what? Corroded. If it becomes too alkaline, what happens? You get algae growing on the surface of the pool. So now if it's too acidic, what do you do to make it more alkaline? You add alkaline. If it's too alkaline, what do you do to make it acidic? Add acid. Okay, it's that simple. The human body is no different. Here's the pH scale. In health, in perfect health, your cellular pH should be between a 7 and an 8 in health. Now you see over here is really acid, and over on this side where there's 14, that's really alkaline. We want to be ideally in the middle. The human body will not get sick until you drop below a 7 at the cellular pH. And what disease that would be will depend upon your genetic makeup. If you inherited a weak heart, then it will not heart as well. If you inherit a weak liver, it won't liver as well. Once you get below that pH of a 7, then your body starts to produce disease. Now, according to Dr. Joel Robbins, head of the uh, um, College of Natural Health in Tulsa, Oklahoma, he said that cancer doesn't set up in the body until the cellular pH is 5.7 or lower. Now, that's interesting. Okay, so just because you get below 7 in the pH scale doesn't mean you're going to get cancer. It doesn't set up till 5.7 or lower. Now, it doesn't mean if your cellular pH is at 5.7 that you have cancer, not even at 5.1, but it means this, that if you do get cancer, it's going to grow rapidly because you've created an acidic environment. Okay, what to eat for health. This is where I'm going to allow Jeannie to come on up and take control. Okay, we want to know what we should eat to help our bodies to become more alkaline. Very, very important because we don't want our bodies becoming acidic. So what I'd like to do is give you a list and I'm going to start actually with the foods that will be acidic in your body. Now this is not going to be a comprehensive list, but it's going to give you a good idea of where your food choices should lie. So we're going to start with the acid producing foods and we're going to start with those foods that are least acid producing and work our way up to those that are the most acid producing. So cooked grains are acid producing in the body for the most part. With the exception of millet and quinoa, those grains actually are alkaline producing in your body. Uh, but the balance of your grains when they're cooked are actually acid producing in the body. Okay, after the cooked grains we have fruits and vegetables that have been cooked. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about these in a minute. Dairy, any dairy is acid producing in the body. Sugar, all of your refined sugars are acid producing. Uh, the only refined sugar that is not acid producing is maple syrup. So you'll probably be happy to know that, at least most people are very happy to find that out. That's alkaline producing in your body. Other than that, your refined sugars are all acid producing. Next we have meat. This includes red meat, it includes white meat, fish. If it had a face, a mother, or a liver, that's considered meat, okay? And it's acid producing, and this is already now starting to get quite acid producing in the body. Next we have spicy foods, and again these are very acid producing. Fried foods, our list is getting uh, to, the, to the more uh, acid producing now. Coffee and tea, this does include green tea. We have quite a, a fad that is happening right now with green tea. Uh, we tend to equate green with good. But green tea has as much caffeine in it as black tea comes from the same plant, different leaves. And green tea is acid producing in your body. So these are things that are going to tend toward disease that you'll want to be avoiding. Salt is acid producing. We need a little bit of salt in our, in our diet, um, but very little. Uh, roughly about a teaspoon or so a day is what we need in our bodies. 
And the best form to get that in would be your Celtic sea salt. But you don't want to be exceeding uh, that recommendation because it will be acid producing in your system. Okay, alcohol is acid producing as are drugs and medications and tobacco. These are all acid producing substances. Now if you want to go into greater detail, you can research this on the internet, you can, you can find a lot more, but this gives you a basic idea of those things that you will want to avoid or limit in order to have better health. Okay, we're going to put up a list now of alkaline producing foods and we're going to start with those foods that are most alkaline producing leading to the least alkaline producing. So raw fruits, very alkalizing in the body. And dried fruits, we're going to talk about that again in a minute here, but dried fruits also are very alkaline producing in our bodies. Raw vegetables, and frozen fruits and vegetables. We'll talk a little bit more about frozen fruits and vegetables here shortly. Uh, these again are good choices for making your body more alkaline. Lightly steamed fruits and vegetables can be another good choice. Raw nuts and raw seeds. These are all alkaline producing in the body. Your least alkaline producing is uh, a sprouted grain and that is an alternative. Some individuals, they, they don't want to have the cooked grain in their diet. Um, and you can sprout your grains. I might add right here that we don't promote a 100% raw food diet. Some people come and they ask us if they should be eating all raw food. And that's not what we're about. That's not what we promote. We do promote a good consumption. We like to recommend to most people about an 80-20 diet where you would have about 80% of your nutrients coming from raw, fresh foods and about 20% from your cooked food category. As Rudy explained, when you heat those foods, you're going to lose enzymes, you're going to lose nutrients, and so you want to limit those foods. And in a moment here, I'm going to show you a hierarchy of food preparation so you can actually see those foods that uh, would be good to limit in your diet. What we would like to, to talk about now are what are the long-term effects of eating a junk food diet? Does it really matter if I just eat hamburgers and drink pop and, and eat potato chips? Is that really going to matter? In fact, I've known people over the years that their, their diet has consisted of predominantly junk foods and they seem to be healthy and they have energy and they just keep going. So does it really make a difference? Well, I'd like to show you a study called the Pottinger Cat Study. Have any of you ever heard of Dr. Francis Pottinger? Anybody here ever heard of Dr. Somebody, okay, a couple of you have heard of Dr. Francis Pottinger. He was a medical doctor and he did a very famous experiment on cats. He took about 900 cats and he divided these cats up into predominantly two categories. There, were, there was the raw food cats, which were re receiving all of their diet basically as raw food. Uh, there was the cooked food cats who were receiving the basic life-sustaining diet, uh, but they were receiving the, the bulk of their diet in the form of cooked or uh, denatured foods. So there was pa they were receiving pasteurized milk, evaporated milk, and condensed milk. And he observed these cats over the course of several generations to see the effect that this nutrient uh, content would have on the cats. And this is what he found. On the first generation, the raw food cats remained healthy. That was to be expected. The generation that was eating, the first generation of the cooked food cats that were eating predominantly cooked foods, they were healthy through the most of their life, but near the end of their life, they began to develop illness and disease. On the second generation, the raw food cats remained healthy. The cats that were receiving the most of their food from cooked sources, they developed disease and illness, but this was now in the middle of their life. So they were actually starting to develop the same diseases that their parents had, but at an earlier age. Third generation, the raw food cats remained healthy. The cats that were eating predominantly cooked food, they now developed disease and illness 
in the beginning of their life. And you know, when I first came across this study, I found this very shocking. Because I don't know about you, but have you noticed the trend with our children, the young people in our society, the diseases that they are getting? The number one killer of children under the age of 13 is cancer. This used to be a disease that you didn't hear about until older age, and it's now striking children. There's juvenile arth uh, arthritis, there's juvenile diabetics. Our children are ending up with the diseases that it used to be our parents or grandparents had. And when I saw this study, I thought, this is just incredible when we think about that in terms of human nutrition. The fourth generation, the raw food cats, remained healthy. The cooked food cats, there was no fourth generation. Those cats either were sterile or they aborted their offspring. And it was very interesting as Dr. Pottinger observed the effects of a predominantly cooked food diet and he saw changes that took place in these cats. Cats normally, if you will, drop a cat, uh, it will right itself, it lands on all four paws. But these cats were very lethargic. When he would drop them, they would just fall. Uh, the females became very aggressive. It was almost like role reversal. And the females became very aggressive. In fact, three of them, they named them tiger, cobra, and rattlesnake. They were, that represented their characteristics that these cats had. They were very aggressive. And as we look at what's happening in society today and the way that our children are eating, I really wonder what would happen if we would just make a real shift in what we're feeding them, if we would put nutrition into these kids and see what the difference would be. Okay, I'd like to share with you now what's called the hierarchy of food preparation. This comes from Dr. Joel Robbins uh, from his book titled Health Through Nutrition, and he's listed out the best sources of getting your foods, the nutrients from your foods. The very best way to get your nutrients is raw and whole. You're going to receive about 30% of those nutrients to cellular level, okay? In the processing of that food, some of those nutrients are used, and you end up getting about 30% to the cells. That's the best way to get it. And along with that, as a supplement would be juiced and consumed immediately, you're going to get about 90% of those nutrients into your cells. So that's the, the top two choices for getting nutrition to your body. Now, some people have said, well, wouldn't it be better to just have juicing because you're getting 90% of the nutrients to your cells? Well, we couldn't just uh, exist on juicing. We need to have fiber. We need to keep that digestive tract working. But juicing is a wonderful addition to uh, supplement into your diet to add nutrients. So those are the top two choices. Now next would be dehydrated or dried. Now commercially dried fruits and vegetables are not generally recommended because they usually contain additives that are very toxic to the human body. So I recommend either dehydrating your fruits and vegetables yourself or buying them uh, from an organic uh, source. Generally, those are better choices, and they don't contain those uh, additives which will be harmful to your health. And here you're going to lose about 2 to 5% of the nutrients. It's not a great loss, so this is a very good food choice. Next, we have frozen. Now, frozen would uh, ideally be something that you picked from your garden and you put into your freezer yourself. Generally, the foods that you buy in the grocery store that have been frozen don't contain high amounts of nutrients. So this would be more something that you would have done yourself. And here we're going to lose anywhere from 5 to 30 percent of the nutrients. Now, the reason there's such a wide uh, difference there in nutrient loss is because it's going to depend what you did to it before it actually got into your freezer. So if it sat on your counter for a period of time, until you actually got it into your freezer, it's going to lose some of its nutrition. Or if you put it through a blanching process or something to that effect, it's going to lose more of its nutrition. The more processing that's done from garden to freezer, the more nutrition that's going to be lost. Okay, next we have steamed. Now by steamed, we mean if the green bean is, if it's limp, 
that's cooked. If it's still crispy, that's steamed. That's how you tell the difference, okay? So steamed, we're going to lose 15 to 60 percent of the nutrients. Now this could be uh, quite a significant loss depending on how long you're steaming it for. 60 percent is already quite a loss of nutrition. Next we have raw leftovers. So this would be the salad. You made up a big salad today and you said, boy, I'm going to I'm, I've got extra time today, I'm going to make enough for tomorrow and the day after as well. Uh, this is what we're talking about. So this salad, you stick it in the fridge, raw leftovers, we're going to lose anywhere from 20 to 70 percent of the nutrients. This is a fairly significant nutritional loss that is happening. So what I like to recommend to individuals is take all your produce, your lettuce, your tomatoes, whatever it is you're going to be putting into the salad, wash it all up, that's no problem, wash it, store it in your fridge, but don't actually chop it until you're ready to use it. Because every time you cut that lettuce leaf, you're exposing those edges to oxygen and that causes free radical damage. So it's better to just chop it right before you use it and only enough for what you're going to need. Now we come to cooked, and this is usually where most of us like to start our food choices, cooked. And here we're going to lose anywhere from 40 to 100 percent of the nutrients, a very significant nutritional loss. Then we have cooked leftovers. What do you think? It's almost not worth it. 100 percent virtually a loss of the nutrients in there, and again it's going to depend what it is that we've uh, got as a leftover and how it was cooked and how it was stored, but we can lose anywhere up to 100 percent of the nutrients. Microwaved, this is uh, the invention of the century, microwave, we lose virtually 90 to 99 percent of the nutrients and now we have the addition of toxins. In that process of actually microwaving that food, it's creating a toxic substance that's going to enter our bodies. And there's a lot of research that's been done on that, um, which we don't have time to go into. But microwaving is not uh, something that we recommend for heating your food. Okay, commercially canned foods, we lose virtually all of the nutrients and we have toxins, usually there's additives, things that have been put in there. Uh, fried foods is basically the same as our foods with additives. So you can see the bottom half of this chart, if, we, if that is where we are consuming most of our nutrients from, we are going to be setting ourselves up for an acidic body which is going to tend toward disease. So we like to encourage you to make your food choices from the upper half of this chart and that will help your body to become more alkaline and it will help your body to uh, ward off any diseases. Now this time Rudy is going to uh, come up, he's going to share with you some very interesting facts about food. As you can see, the, uh, uh, the, the evidence is mounting, it's adding up. Why are we sick? It's very clear, it's very clear, but we don't want to admit that. We'd rather keep eating and take a pill to sober us up or get us better. And that's the attitude of most people. But we can't do that. You cannot disobey the laws of health and get away with it. You cannot poison your body into health, neither could you sin your way into heaven. It just won't happen. Now. In America, the food industry spends more than $33 billion a year to advertise junk food. But the American Cancer Center spends $1 million a year to encourage people to eat fruits and vegetables. Who's going to win? Whoever gets heard the most is going to win. And so you see, it's like a losing battle. If you really want to deal with cancer, we don't need to find a cure. What we need is find the cause. Because if you find the cause, you found the cure. Does that make sense to you? We see cancer, and I'm not kidding you, we see cancer reverse on a regular basis with people. Isn't that amazing? If your pancreas is overloaded, which most people have, and your liver is overloaded, which most people have, and your digestive system doesn't work right, which most people have, then you are going to end up a very sick individual and probably a candidate for cancer. 
Uh, this was an ad that came up in the, the place where we live, out in New Brunswick. This was an ad. And uh, take a look at this. <laughs> you know, as if a double wasn't enough. What do they have today? The quad. And McDonald's has introduced what? The double Mac. You know, it seems like we just can't get enough. Do you know that American Airlines has increased the size of their seats? I think it is by two, two inches to accommodate the passengers who are getting bigger and bigger. If you go to clothing stores, you don't see large anymore. What do you see? Relaxed. <laughs> we're not fat, we're relaxed. That's how it works. I hope you can make this out. If you can, I'll read it for you. This says, here's a Burger King burger. 1954, here was the average size burger on the left. Look in the year 2004. That's the average size burger. Beginning to see the difference? We're eating more. We're eating more of the wrong foods. Look at this. This is 1955. There's the average McDonald's fries, 1955. Look in 2004. You see a difference? I see a difference. That's just amazing. We have switched from visiting fast food restaurants once in a while to the fast food restaurants becoming breakfast, lunch, and dinner for a whole lot of people. Look at this. This is 1960. I believe it says. No, it's not, 1900. A Hershey's bar. Look at the size of it. That was the average size Hershey's bar in 1900. Take a look in 2004. What a difference. This is uh, uh, 1916. There's a Coke, a bottle of Coke. Here's the average size today, 2004. Look at that. What a difference. From 6.5 ounces to 16 ounces. Huh. And look at the theater popcorn. The 1950s. Look at this. Three cups. And over here, 2004, 21 cups is the average size. Do you see what we're doing to ourselves? We're digging our graves with a fork, knife, and spoon. And we wonder why it is that every child autopsied under the age of four has incipient to severe cardiac problems. When you see the big gulps that are going down these children, do you realize that big gulp can cause the immune system to be put on hold for 24 hours? The immune system, the sugars in that drink, the immune system put right on hold. I have seen a lot of people go through my office. I do a lot of blood work. And when I see the condition of people's blood and the condition of their health and they're so bewildered, they don't know what is going on with me. The poor doctors, they honestly don't have any answers. They don't because they're not taught what the answers are to our, to our um, symptom problems. You see, they're taught that for every single symptom, there's a drug medication or a surgery or some such procedure. Do you know something? For every symptom, there is a cause. And what we have to do is we have to reason from cause to effect. If I have a headache, do I have a headache because I haven't had enough aspirin that day? <laughs> no. Am I constipated because I haven't had enough laxatives today? No. We have to look at why it is we're getting constipated, why the headaches are taking place, why the irritable bowel syndrome, why the diabetes, why disease on the up, up, up continually. You know, one man came into my office to see me, had his blood work done. He was a bodybuilder. This man was eating, I think it was 500 grams of protein a day. The average North American consumes about 160 grams a day. He was consuming 500 grams of protein a day. He had very bad osteoporosis. His bones were killing him. He said every time he went to exercise, it hurt, but he loved to exercise. He was doing a good thing. The exercise is great. But what he was putting into his stomach was actually causing his body to be robbed of the nutrients. Remember that when I showed you the citric acid cycle and the carrot coming in and the donut coming in? What do you think happens with all the protein that goes into the system and it doesn't digest properly in the intestines? What happens? The body will pull calcium from the bones because there's no other nutrition coming in and it will neutralize the uric acids produced from the putrefaction of protein in the intestines. I asked this man what his bowel movements were like. He said about once every three days. He looked kind of healthy, 
But inside, there was a whole lot of problems taking place. I could see it in his blood work. So with this man, I said, now, would you be interested in changing your diet and lifestyle? He said, well, that's why I've come to see you. What can I do? I said, would you like to increase your energy? He said, oh, I'd like that. I said, would you like to increase your stamina so you could exercise longer and harder? He said, I would love that. I said, would you like to increase your uh, levels of energy? He said, well, yeah, I would because I'm getting really energy deficient. And I said, okay, here's what you need to do. Take all the animal proteins out of your diet. He said, where am I going to get my protein from? I said, where did the cow get it from that you ate? He said, well, from grains, from grasses, from plants. I said, yes, exactly. And I said, how many grams of protein do you think that bull consumed today? He said, I have no idea. I said, not as much as you did. And you don't weigh 2,000 pounds. So you don't need 500 grams of protein. You need one gram of protein for every five pounds of body weight. Two-thirds of the body's protein requirements are supplied by the body itself through the breakdown of old cellular material in the system. Two-thirds of your daily requirements. So you only need to put in about 25 to 35 grams of protein and your body will do well. Now this bodybuilder said, I believe you. I'm going to try this because you're making sense here. I said, okay, now your protein powders, you got to get rid of them. He goes, oh, but they're so good. And I said, good for what? You've got osteoporosis as a result of these. Your kidneys are extremely stressed. He had all kinds of inorganic materials built up in the nephronic membranes of his kidneys. So I said, do you want to get well? He said, yeah. I said to him, well, then you've got to do something different here. What you've been doing hasn't been working. So he said, okay, I'm going to try this. So he did. Do you know something? As I thought about this, plants are nutrient storehouses. But creatures such as man, animals, birds, are nutrient users. Plants don't need all the nutrients in them. They just store them. But we need the nutrients. We burn them up. And so we have to get them from a warehouse, not from another plant eater, not from another, you know, not from another fleshy creature. Does that make sense to you? Because as my research is done, and I've got stacks, I mean stacks of research, I wanted to find out what are all the nutrients in salmon, for instance. What are all the nutrients in chicken? And you know what I found? There is not one nutrient in salmon that is not available from plants. There's not one nutrient in chicken, beef, liver, turkey, any other animal, pig, moose, deer, elk. There's not one nutrient that's not available from plants. So why get your nutrients from those animals? Get them from plants. Now, People don't want to change their diets really fast. And I don't recommend that you change your diet really fast to because probably what's going to happen is if you switched from being a um, meat-based diet to a plant-based diet overnight, within about three days, you might not be able to get out of bed and you won't like Jeannie and I very much. <laughs> You'll say, this isn't working. I feel horrible. Actually, what your body is showing you is your true state of health. It says you've been running on all the stimulation that those drugs and chemicals in the meat provides. And when the meat is not there, you've got nothing to run on. That's what it's telling you. You've got nothing to run on. So let's get back to the bodybuilder. That bodybuilder took the advice. And I'm here to share with you that in two months' time, he came back to see me. Two months. I checked him. He had reversed osteoporosis. No more mineral loss. His stamina was increased double-fold. He said, I couldn't believe it. What used to wear me out in a half hour, I was going for an hour and I still had energy left. He said, I got rid of the protein drinks. His blood pressure went right down to a healthy 100 over 60 from 140 over 90. Isn't that beautiful? Fantastic. Plus... He had greater increases in muscle mass. 
he had not only the more stamina, but he had more energy. He had greater workouts and all the people in the gym that were around him said, what are you doing? And when he told them what he was doing, what do you think they said? No, no, I'm sorry, that, that can't be. And he says, what do, you, what do you want? I was blind, now I see. What more is there? And so they began to believe and he's been an effective person to all those people in the gym. And by the way, before I get on to anything else, I want to share with you that if you're on drug medications of any kind, and you want to get off your drug medications, I would not counsel you, as I do not counsel anybody else, to stop taking your drug medications right now. Say, that's it, I'm going to switch my diet and stop everything. No, here's what I suggest you do. You go back to your medical doctor. Tell your medical doctor what it is you're planning on doing. And maybe your medical doctor will say to you, uh-uh, that doesn't work. What you need to say at that point is, okay, doc, here's your chance to prove it wrong. Document this. Monitor me and see if my medications don't become too strong for me. That's the challenge. And then if you do that and the doctor sees these improvements, and don't take no for an answer. It's your body. It's your right. But do it wisely. Let your doctor know when your doctor sees all these things taking place and your health improving, maybe your doctor will be able to help others. Does that make sense? He'll say, look what's doing for them. Let's try it with you. Maybe it'll be effective also. And then your doctor is going to become a living, breathing testimony for health reform. Now here's what you do. In the book of Romans, chapter 12, verse 21, it says this. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. If you want to overcome any bad habits of eating that you have, don't focus on quitting. Don't even focus on quitting the burgers, the fries. But here's what you focus on, because you'll never do it if you try that act. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because if you could quit, you would have quit. But it's evident you can't. So here's what you do. You overcome evil with good. Add the good to what you're currently doing and add it first in your meal. If you add an ice green smoothie, which we'll be telling you all about later on through the week, we're going to show you how to change your life and get rid of all the symptoms that you're talking about. We're going to show you how to do that. But here's the key. Add the good first. And if you fill up on a nice big salad, you won't have as much room for that greasy burger. And so you may only eat half of it. So you eat your good food first, add the good, and it'll overcome the evil. I have people come back to the office all the time and they'll say, you know, it's funny. I'm not craving the coffee anymore. That's funny. I'm not craving cigarettes anymore. That's really interesting. But I'm not craving sweets. One lady said they had a chocolate tray at the office for Christmas and she didn't even want one. And she was the type who would sneak a whole box by herself in her office. She says, it was a change. I don't believe it. I didn't try to quit the chocolates. I just lost the desire. Why? Because she was adding the good. And the body said, I want more of the good. And she said, one day, she said, I couldn't believe it. I actually had two green smoothies for lunch because I wanted another green smoothie and I had no room for anything else. And you should have seen what her skin was looking like. She had it all blotchy, but now it was all looking very nice. Two months, just in two months. And it takes longer for some people, shorter for other people. But your body will improve as you improve what you put into it. And you know, there's a slogan that we have. I'm trying to think if I've missed anything here in the presentation. Because I want to really encourage you people, okay, to do what is good. There's a slogan that, we, that we, we, we keep around here, and that is this. You are what you choose. <laughs> you are. Your body only makes itself from whatever you put in. If you put dead food in, it's going to produce a dead body. But if you put living food in, it doesn't die. The body miraculously changes it into living bone, flesh, muscle, skin, hair. Does that make sense? 
So it doesn't die, it's just transformed. But if you, and it gives its energy, by the way, to the body. But if you put in dead food, cooked food, your body has to draw energy from its own self to digest it. And that's when the pancreas and the liver get in trouble. So I hope these things make sense to you. Yes? Okay. Have you learned anything you can take home, practice, and be a blessing to your friends and your loved ones with? That is our goal. Thank you, everyone.